So in a male context, specifically mm-hmm. in the male journey, yeah. what are the things that are coming up through that? What are the main uh, kind of uh, barriers that have to be over? What's going on, man? Where have you been at? You've been hiding off in the wilderness for a little while right now. I've been, been hiding in the mountains the last month and a half or so, writing a, uh, writing a book, doing an online course. And the book is all about the, the embodied man, yeah. helping, uh, helping men essentially wake the fuck up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what does that look like? As I suppose I'd like to hear a bit about your journey and how you got to waking the fuck up yourself. <laughs> so that's a good starting point. So b- before we get into the book and the waking the fuck up bit, yeah. let's talk about the bit where you were half asleep and not woken the fuck Absolutely. up. Absolutely. Good, good point. Well, yeah, I'm a ship's captain by trade. Um, spent years operating big container ships, uh, oil tankers, cruise ships all over the world for a long time. I can say that's kind of where I found my soul for the first time at 19. Um, but the childhood I came from, fucking a lot of dysfunction, a lot of chaos, a lot of turmoil and abuse and neglect and all the different you know shapes and sizes of that. And yeah, my turn to alcohol. I turned to the addiction of alcohol. It's the only thing I knew. It was like, oh, I could have a couple of drinks and all of a sudden my problems went away. Um, and then I eventually found myself doing a master's in spiritual psychology in my early 20s. Um, and just dove into this field of transformation. And I had all these questions and chaos and things in my past. And I'm like, all right, God, like, why did you give me such a bad hand? Like, (laughs) that's a little bit strange, you know? And then I just started diving in more and more. And yeah, there was a long time where I did feel very uh, asleep at the wheel and didn't necessarily know what was going on. But what I always felt was there is an inner inquiry to, to find out more and to discover a deeper place of what this whole journey of life is really all about. Um, so that's, you know, kind of navigator, merchant mariner, spiritual psychology. I've dipped my toes in a lot of different fields. And yeah, the last probably seven, eight years deep into the field of Tantra, really the only modality I've experienced in all of my searching that really encapsulates the entirety of the human experience, where sexuality, emotions, heart, mind are all, all welcome and all part of the conversation. Uh, and I kind of... You know, as I'm writing this book, I wish I could give it to my, you know, 18-year-old self. Be like, here, here's a manual. Here's a manual on how to master masculinity from the head to the heart to the balls. How not to be a dickhead. Yeah, exactly. I, <laughs> like, I feel like, one, I could use that book. And two, a lot of people listening to this can probably use this book. I mean, because it's so distorted. Mm. Uh, what we're taught and what we grow up with is what being a man is. Mm. This book has been very much my journey, seeing what an absolute shit human <laughs> I used to be <laughs> but I never had any guidance right there was never a real male role model in my MF mm-hmm. that gave me that guidance or even gave me any indication of what it actually meant to be a half decent man let alone human mm-hmm. spot some of the unconsciousness that was going on so what was Aaron doing when he was 18 what was like some of the, the blind spots some of the unconsciousness that was going on there was a, a lot of alcohol there was, uh, yeah, just a lot of a lot of numbing. There was a lot of stuff inside I didn't know how to feel, and the blind spot was, you know, alcohol, sex, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It was like, you know, but at the age actually before I went to the the academy, you know, I went to a merchant marine academy, and when I was, you know, 17 years old, in a deep journey that didn't want to end up there, and one night, like paranoid, off of my off of my arse. So, no, no, you can say you're completely <laughs> off your fucking tits here. Right? It's fine. I was, you I can was, talk however you like. Okay, here, mate. Good, Don't good, you worry. Yeah, Don't I, I was completely gone, like so paranoid, so terrified, so afraid. And when all of that finally dissolved, and I remember I was just resting in my bed, and I had this vision. I had this vision of how I could live my 20s. So instead of going to this kind of small liberal art school, um, you know, getting an education, playing, I was playing soccer a lot at the time. I had this vision of like, all right, I can go through military school. It's going to be pretty fucked. But I can learn this different thing. I can start to be a leader. I can have a, a, a license to operate ships right when I get out of you know, 22 and give me more freedom. So it gave me a, a different view of looking at life. And it took me a, a lot longer to figure things out. But there was just these different moments along the way where different voices came through and it was like okay which voice am i going to listen to this one that's just you know fucking and 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 doing whatever it pleases in the world or is it that voice that's like hey you know this may be a different direction you can go here there's there's a different way um and that voice 
it, it's been challenging at times to listen to. And I feel like men, especially because that voice can feel like this aloneness inside. And like, there's been a lot of times when I've been deeply alone and like, no one understands me. I don't understand what's happening in the world. This doesn't make sense. And you know, at, at 18 on a ship, I almost took my life. I almost jumped overboard. I was just like, I, why bother being here? There's so much stuff inside. There's so much anger and sadness and, and frustration. Like, might as well just go back home, wherever home is. It doesn't feel like it's in this body, right? And that it just, each one of those moments along the way kind of set me more in this journey. Um, so yeah, to give back to that 18-year-old that and to say, hey, I know you're struggling right now. I know you have a lot of issues that you're dealing with, but just just hold course. Like stay stay steady, keep doing your thing, keep listening to the best as you can. You know, have fun and do all the debaucherous things you're gonna do. <laughs> I know you're going to. <laughs> Massive shout out to the yeah. debauchery. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I finished at university after four years of military school. My, uh, one of my good friends, father did a lot of work in Kiev and he's like, what do you, your boys do? Go to Ukraine. We're like, okay. <laughs> we went to Ukraine and we had a good time. <laughs> tell, tell, tell me a little bit about Ukraine, Aaron. Is there anything you'd like to uh, add? I would say it was, it was debauchery at its finest. Okay. Fantastic. Debauchery I've heard good things finest. about the Ukraine yeah, actually. Ukraine, uh, I have a, an insatiable love for Ukrainian women. Oh, okay. okay. The, the, okay. The, and, and just this merging between Europeans and Russians and it was just like in my family roots of a couple of generations back from Ukraine so um yeah just hang you know. out a minute sorry so I got a little bit confused there so debauchery with Ukrainians and now you're moving into family is it is, is it the family tie that they're attracted to in the first <laughs> maybe, maybe there's some weird shit there <laughs> okay there's now I'm starting to see what the weird suppressed going on. It's, starting, it's starting to make some sense now okay but no I mean it was uh you know we spent about four months traveling exploring you know, drinking a lot, having a lot of sex with a lot of women and, and enjoying the journey. And yeah. it was just like, and I remember at the end of that trip, I was like, okay, I got onto a ship for two, three months, made a buckload of money, you know, filled up my bank account. And then I went off to do it again. Mm -hmm. And then like slowly in those travels where I would work out at sea and I started to pick up like a book here and there and be like, oh, I remember when I was um, on one of those ships, I read Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now. And, and the new earth and it was like ah okay this is speaking something but i'm and it was just like this this dance of like debauchery is good but there's something else here and it's like this push and pull that was happening inside you know mm. that's something i can relate to very but, much in my journey there was always like when i was younger there's the, it's kind of like the the pull of the animal side of yourself that mm. just wants to do all these uh instant gratification type things right and you're chasing all these different things that you think that you need but there's also that little voice, or at least that's what I had, is exactly that little voice that pulled me towards psychology. I'm sure it's similar to you in so many respects. There's like this voice that's saying, no, there's a little bit more going on here. Mm. What is actually happening? Mm -hmm. But then you kind of flip from slightly waking up a little bit and paying attention to it to then going back into your old habits and patterns and just dealing with whatever's in front of you right now. Mm -hmm. And then slowly but surely, the more you read, the more information you consume from better sources, things start to, to drop in and then you start to make different choices. Mm. So what different choices did you start to make? So you're in this place where you've just discovered the joys of the Ukraine. <laughs> you, you want to go back there, but you're also sit here and that little voice is telling you there's something else to do. What started happening from there? Well, there, there was a moment that happened for me. Um, I was in Boston. I had just upgraded my mariner's license. So as a mariner, first license you get is a third mate. And then I upgraded to my second mate's license. So, and I, this was on a Monday. I just finished this job. I was going to go work on another ship. I went into the union hall and they said, hey, we have this, this job on a, a grain ship. You'll meet it in Kenya. You'll take it to Buenos Aires. You know, from Buenos Aires, you'll take it to Israel. And my buddy was going to meet me in Israel and we were going to get up to a lot more debauchery and fun in Israel, which, of course. you know, Israel has stood for that. Um, and I took the job on a Monday and like I was full in. I went out that night with my buddies celebrating. I was like, new job, new money, new all this. And Tuesday morning, I was staying at my sister's place and I woke up and my whole body was like, no. And I, and I had this like this full battle happening inside where... Literally, my phone was ringing and it was a union hall saying, hey, bro, like you got to come in, finish the paperwork. We're flying you Wednesday night to, to Kenya. And I couldn't I couldn't answer the phone. I remember just looking there on the couch and the phone was ringing. And it was like there's this voice inside that said, don't pick that up. Don't pick that up. 
and I didn't know why. Like I didn't have, I had no understanding or, or, or meaning of why I wouldn't do that. Cause everything in my mind was like new job, new money, new opportunity, all this. And yet there was something else inside that was pulling at me. So I just turned within, like I started to feel, I talked to a few different friends and what I ended up deciding in that moment, you know, instead of flying to, to Kenya that Wednesday, I actually flew to LA. Um, I had a partner out there who had introduced me to a little bit in the world of mindfulness and um, science of mind and, and some psychology programs. She had told me about this program out there. And as soon as I felt that thought of going to LA, it was like my whole body said, yes, yes. And I could still hear my mind being like, but, but you need to make more money. You need to do this and you're going to have more fun. Like everything was lining up in the mind one way, but the body was leading somewhere else. And so, yeah, I, I never returned the phone call. <laughs> to the <laughs> you went AWOL. Hall. I went AWOL. And that Wednesday, I, I flew to LA and they had an information night, actually, uh, perfect timing at the university. And that night, I registered for the program. A month or so later, I bought a boat out there. I started, you know, integrating, uh, you know, my maritime world with my meditation desire. I was teaching people how to meditate. And I just took this whole other trajectory all really from that one piece inside of recognizing I had a, a, a fork in the road. And that one fork was like everything was lining up in one way. And the other fork, there was a lot of mystery. I didn't know what was going to happen in L.A. I didn't know what was going to involve. But when I made that decision, a month or two later, I ended up um, connecting with the self-development publishing company. So I started working for a, you know, a publishing company and, and bringing in authors, sharing stories like, thank God I was raped and thank God my son died and thank God I was sexually molested. We had thousands of authors sharing short stories and I just fully immersed into the world of self-development. It was like all of a sudden all of these different things that I've been thinking about that I've been writing poetry in like bar stools for the last five years where I was like having moments and glimpses. Finally, I had full permission to dive fully into that and I just turned off a lot of the outside world. I was like, the only thing that existed was self-development and growing and I matured and I, and I understood a lot. And it was a, you know, it was a beautiful time in my life where so much was shifting and I'm grateful for in that moment, I, I had the capacity to recognize there's two choices here and I could choose the one that was uncomfortable, but yet there was a knowing in my soul that was leading me there. I really want to tap into that fork moment because I feel like that's something that's, that happens for everybody somewhere along the line, mm -hmm. whether it be a mental breakdown of some sort, whether it be the end of a particular relationship that you're attached to. There's always this kind of moment where you have a choice between two different worlds mm -hmm. and there's always these two different draws. And I think it's at those moments that really kind of dictate what the rest of your life's going to look like. Because mm -hmm. had you gone on that ship, had you ignored that voice, then your life would probably be very different now. Because mm -hmm. if you ignore it the first time, second, third... It gets quieter and quieter as time goes on, I believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what would you say to anybody that's in that position right now where they're kind of feeling drawn between two different worlds? What mm. would you say about listening to that little voice? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. You know, that voice, it's like a muscle. And the more that you give yourself the willingness to listen to it, the more it's going to grow and expand. Um, so somebody who is at that fork in the road, begin to differentiate between what the mind is saying what the heart is saying, and usually there's two other voices there as well, the voice of the belly, the emotional body that's like all over, and then also our sexual energy. So that might feel a little overwhelming because there's four voices. We just started talking about two, and now we're at four. What, what are we going on here? So the best thing you can do is just really differentiate in the decision-making process that's coming forth. Am I trying to do something that's going to make me remember myself as worthy? Am I trying to do something to prove myself to the world? Like that decision of going on the ship, I could, as I started to break it down, there was a lot of like, oh, I still need to prove to my father that I'm going to make a certain amount of money. I still need to like prove to my maritime buddies that I'm still like that debaucherous sailor. And I was like, oh, that's an interesting voice. Oh, wow. Okay. So what happens when all of those different voices dissolve away? And there I was in the space of the unknown. And with strong addictions, and especially for the male psyche, there's a part of us that doesn't like the unknown. A part of us that likes control, organized structure, and, and form. And so I had to sit with that and realize that there was a lot of control and structure in making that decision to the ship. And there was a lot of unknown in there. So what you can do is you lean into the unknown. You know, a mentor of mine said, it's like you're walking down a hallway. 
there's maybe seven or eight different doors and you can kind of like crack open the door. Oh, is this door even opening? Oh, let me, let me lean in a little bit rather than boom. Okay. I'm here. It's like, let me lean in. How does this feel as I lean into that? And for me in that moment, as I leaned into that place of going to LA instead of Kenya, I could feel in my body that there was something feeling right. There was something that was like starting to vibrate. It was like, yeah, yeah, listen, listen, listen. And the other one was like, but, but pull at me. And I could differentiate in that moment that there was a voice that was like the ego driven mind that was trying to do something. And there was the intuitive guided soul that was pulling me in this other way. And it, it requires courage more than anything. And I've also at times in my life listened and, and totally fell flat on my face. It's like, that's part of the journey is we're going to fail. But having the capacity to listen to that voice and the willingness and the courage requires a part of our being to, to dissolve in that moment and to really tune into the, 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 the space inside the heart, you know, and I say the heart and, you know, one of the big things I speak about in this book that I just wrote is like that voice of the heart is, is sometimes difficult to really hear. It's sometimes because then there's the voice of the cock for a man and there's a the voice of like the belly that's mommy and daddy didn't love me. And, and that's really strong. And then the mind's like, but you got to do this and this is happening here. And this is, you got to do this and you have to prove your purpose in this way. And this is happening. And it's like, and then the heart's like, Hey, Hey, I, Hey, I, I'm, I'm here. And no, 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 no. So a lot of, a lot of men, especially go a lot of their lives, just pushing that down and pushing that down. And so the encouragement is to let that, come through as best as you can and like to actually one of the processes that I started doing and, and, and was actually allowing a dialogue where you know I would give a voice to my heart which is I feel most connected to the soul that literally looks like opening up a computer paper or you know a computer screen or a sheet of paper and just saying hey hi soul like how are you and the soul's like oh good you know and it, it feels that should feel quite crooky and weird but by doing that, every aspect of our body has a place that can provide insight and information. Um, so anyone who might be listening, who's finding their way with that decision, it's like, can I give myself five or 10 minutes at the end of the night or in the morning just to tune into that deeper voice to see what's alive, to see where it might be guiding you? Yeah, I think that's really important. I think it's good for people to try to get because... I can relate to my mind telling me what to do very easily, as I'm sure most people can. I've got to do this next thing, constantly reactive, constantly looking at my phone at this next message, this next notification, this next objective and goal that needs to be achieved. That's my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of that. Mm -hmm. And that's very much programmed as a result of my upbringing and what I feel like I need to achieve. I can also very much relate to my cop telling me what the fuck to do. That's telling me, <laughs> that's telling me to fuck things. That's what it is, whatever it may be. It might, back in the day, it was, uh, we're talking plug sockets, fucking pie, it doesn't matter. Anything's, anything's open, anything's getting it. Also a dangerous thing to listen to. So the classic example of having those two decisions would be you're in a relationship, perhaps you're in a committed relationship, but your dick's telling you to do one thing and then your heart's telling you to do something else. Mm -hmm. You know, the right thing to do here would be to you know, be faithful to my girlfriend, be an integrity. And then yeah. the, the flip side of that's my dick saying, no, I just want to ejaculate on everyone. That sounds like fun. <laughs> so that, there's a good differentiation between the two. So that heart piece, I feel like is the one that's specifically for men, because I feel like it's something that's kind of attached more to intuition, like that inner kind of feeling of what, what you actually want. That's mm. that kind of voice. The heart's the bit that was telling you to go to LA, right? Whereas mm. the mind was the one that was telling you to get on the ship. Mm -hmm. How do people tap into that heart? process how do you kind of recognize because like you said it's it's so much quieter it's mm -hmm. so much less in your face than your dick telling what you do and your mind telling you to answer that call you know mm -hmm. the the first way to begin to tap into that is to have some some quiet introspective time in your day you know and it's some you can call that meditation you can call that whatever it may be it's time each day where i'm closing down my eyes i'm taking a deep breath in and I'm just starting to like feel into my body because just as you were saying, there is the next notification. There is that next to-do list. There is that next project. And it's like, I know that well, like I love, we've talked about this before, <laughs> like yeah, the new opportunity, it's an opportunity, but to actually like slow down enough to like check in and be like, oh, okay, what, what's, what's actually going on in here? Because when you give yourself that awareness to do that, then that 
voice of the heart's going to be like, oh, oh, you're listening. Oh, oh, I can start to speak to you. And so in the buildup of that time to getting to that decision, I had, you know, read a couple of books. I had kind of pulled at different things. So I knew that this was a moment. There was a moment happening here. And I, I realized, okay, let me really feel what that voice of the heart is trying to express right now. And, and in doing that, it was like, ah, oh, okay, there's a new place. So I think the number one thing that somebody can do is just invite some silence in there, like some intentional silence where, you know, you can sit on a, you know, a cushion in, in your bedroom or you can be, you know, wherever it may be, but you're one of the best definitions of meditation that was ever given to me is an appreciation of what is. You know, you can meditate going for a walk in the garden. You can meditate, you know, I find sometimes I'm not driving cars. I'm not, I don't really do it on a scooter, but sometimes in a car, it's like you get to this like nameless, stateless, formless place. And all of a sudden you're just fully aware of the entire environment around you. So I, I find that to really access this deeper place of the heart requires time that you're slowing down. And that's not like time, oh, I need to go meditate for an hour a day because that just feels too overwhelming for people. Like slow down for two or three minutes in the morning and just have a little check-in. Oh, what's happening in here? And that's going to feel awkward. It's going to, because if your body's not used to it, the mind's going to be like, what are you doing? Where, where you, you know, nope, this isn't, no, no, stop doing this. Yeah. And because for in many ways, the, <coughs> the mind wants to stay in control. It wants to, you know, it wants to be the, the, the navigator. You know, the analogy I often utilize between the heart and the mind is when I worked on the cruise ships, we would always have a two men up on the bridge and one would be the co-navigator and one would be the navigator. And the co-navigator is assimilating all of the information, taking in the wind and the tides and the current and the next port of call and what's happening with the passengers. And the navigator is taking all that information and then making the decision. Most people live their life from their mind being the navigator, just taking this all and going, going, going. And then the heart's like, but, but my voice matters. And so the, the shift that I find is really important is where the heart actually can become the navigator. And then the mind just does what it's supposed to do, which is assimilate information. We're a, we're a bioelectric, magnetic, vibrating machine. Like it, to break it down very simply, the smallest thing that we know on this earth is a cell. A cell is made up of, of a positive charge and a negative charge. So everything that we live in lives in a space of duality. And duality is how the universe is made up. And so at the cellular reality in our body, the mind functions in the form of duality, in the place of, oh, this is good, this is bad, this is kind, this is cruel, this is naughty, this is nice. And so when it can begin to see the complementary dance that's happening inside of the dual world that we live in, then the mind's like, okay, I'm doing my job. I see that, yeah, there's an equal amount of challenge as well as drawbacks that happen. There's an equal amount of benefits as well as advantages. So there's, there's all this. Advantages are happening with the challenges. Drawbacks are happening with the, you know, the, the benefits. So when the mind sees both of these places, then literally, and this heart math shows this really well, actually they break down the science of the mind and the heart and their, their interconnectedness. When the mind begins to do that, the heart has more of a capacity, neural pathways literally open up inside that allow the heart to be a more decisive making machine for life's decisions. And all that is, is a retraining of the brain. So, you know, that was a big part of my journey because I come from a very intellectually driven family. It was like my parents said, do whatever you want, fuck off as much as you want, get good grades, dude. And I'm like, okay, so I understood how to, you know, study and how to do these things. And so when I met this field of self-development, I went deep into why are we here and what is this happening and how does this work? And then I started to see more and more that the mind, both sides of the brain, the right and the left, is just the, the creativity and the logic, the, the reason and the intuition dancing together. So if I can teach my brain how to more effectively understand that there's always a symbiotic relationship happening, then by doing that more consistently, it's going to open up the capacity in the heart to make a decision moving forward. And, and that's a muscle that's growing more and more because the mind is doing its job. 
that decision making process is really interesting to me because this is something over the course of last year I'm working with you and obviously uh, Raven as well that work's been really powerful for me because mm. I've been so stuck in my head constantly problem solving mm. and just actually having the ability to, to, to create that 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 feeling like mm. actually feeling was really difficult for me <laughs> for a long <laughs> I as, remember. You know, as, you, as you remember <laughs> feeling anything completely numb just used to kind of floating through just doing doing things for mm. the sake of doing things mm -hmm. when you talk about creating that space I've done that in the past as well but I'd also do it in a kind of unintentional way it would be or, or actually too intentional perhaps is more appropriate I'm like I'm doing the thing I'm doing the meditation I'm making sure it happens uh -huh. but there was no real intention to create space for my body to tell me what I wanted and what I was doing mm. and I found myself over the years pursuing different businesses pursuing different opportunities because that's what I felt that I needed to do to feel like I'm worthy or good enough whether yeah. that be in the eyes of my father or whatever <laughs> that's a whole different story for another time <laughs> but that also ultimately what it boils down to yeah. generally so I'm just in this space of constantly doing, constantly trying to achieve, but never actually taking a moment to think, why do I actually want to do that? Mm. Why do I actually want to achieve that? Mm -hmm. And the question why for me, is kind of like this question you can ask time after time after time. It's like, okay, so I feel stressed out because I want to do this business. Why do you want to do this business? Mm -hmm. Oh, because I'm going to make money from it. Why do you want to work money from it? Mm -hmm. uh, I guess because then it kind of gives me a bit more freedom to do the things that I want to do. Why do you want freedom to do those things that you want to do? Oh, because then I might find life more, and more enjoyable. Why will you find it more enjoyable? Because there's no restrictions. Or anything. And you can just keep going through the layers mm -hmm. to a certain point. But if you're constantly living in this space of reactivity and constantly just doing, you never even bother to ask yourself the question as to why you want it in the first place. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. whole unconscious process just continues. Mm -hmm. So this is where the heart comes in, right? This is where the heart comes in because, you know, in that question of why that you're asking, it's like I, I lead people often into a, like a death meditation. That where, sounds fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just last night I was running this workshop owning the darkness and anyone up for a bit of death yeah a anyone? little bit of death darkness yeah, yeah, yeah death. please okay. <laughs> but the thing is it's like we have this day-to-day -day life that we're living that has everything that you were just mentioning like the next thing why am i doing this and why am i doing that and what always is interesting to me is can i bring myself to that moment on my deathbed whatever that may be however i'm going to like whenever my soul is physically going to leave this human flesh suit and that question of, okay, well, did I, did I matter? Like, did I give it my all? Like, yeah, I came in for some crazy reason. I chose to incarnate into this flesh suit. I had the crazy childhood, you know, this, that. We all have our own stories. We all have our levels of mom didn't do this, dad did this, this, that. And, and it's all relative. The stories are real. And then life goes on and we learn the skill and we're doing these things and we find love and we buy the house and we do the thing and we have children and all that. And it's like, okay, there's a journey. And there I am. It's, I'm on my deathbed. And you get, can ask yourself that question. You don't need to take yourself to the deathbed. You can bring yourself energetically there. It's like, why, why, why was I here? Like, did I utilize everything that life gave me? Because God... In my perspective, you know, not a religious amorphic God, but a grand organized design, if you will, of this crazy chaotic world that we live in on this spinning piece of rock in the middle of the universe. Like to look at it in that perspective, it's like, OK, so I'm here. I'm not anywhere else. Can I be here now? As so many sages and mystics are always saying at the end of it, can I be here now? OK, I'm here now. And I know that that one time is going to happen when I've transcended the human experience and I'm no longer in this body. And so if I have that awareness that eventually at some point I'm going to die, then what is my why now? Like, is my why so that I get more likes on social media? And maybe it is. It's not to downplay any of that, but to continue diving in. And, and for me, the why, like any time I've been in the deepest mystic journeys and, and connected to the oneness of the universe, it's like there's a strong voice inside of me that says you're here to support others, to awaken the wisdom of their soul and, and to support others to master how they move through their human experience so that the genius inside of you, the genius inside of any individual who's going through this world can actually be expressed. And, and it's not to create, oh, I'm here to create peace on earth. Because peace and war serve equally. 
Anybody, if you, people that are protesting for peace are, are actually creating war. It's the same thing we see happening right now with this whole crazy pandemic situation, all the right doing and wrong doing. There's a great quote I love from Rumi that says, out beyond the field of right doing, out beyond the, the right doing and wrong doing, there is a field and I'd like to meet you there. Because all we know is this right doing and wrong doing and we actually create more of what we don't want when we think that our view is right. No, my truth is the truth. This is the truth. This is the truth. No, this is the truth. And so we're battling. And so to bring it back to that why, it's like if I can recognize the equanimous nature of the universe, then I can give myself a deeper permission to play in the field of possibility, to play in the field of being to the best of one's capacity of beneficial presence. That doesn't mean you need to change people's lives. And maybe that means just sitting in the, in the Himalayas and meditating. Maybe it means, you know, being the best father to children. Maybe it means creating beautiful art. But that knowingness is alive inside of the soul. It's alive inside of every soul. I've never, in all of the session works and all of the work I've done the last 15 years, supported someone or seen someone that's gotten to that place. And there's, it's like there's emptiness and there's a place that's like, this is a seed of creativity. This is the seed of my soul that's expressing itself in the world. And the thing about that as well is that the moment, and I see this happen with people, the mind grabs on to that. It's like, okay, now I'm going to put that. This is, my, this is my vision. This is my purpose. I'm now this thing. It's like, yes, and. Yes, and. Because we are these dynamically changing, shifting, vibrating beings that live in a creative force that actually the more that we can allow life force energy to move through our body because we've equilibrated, neutralized more of our thoughts, perceptions, and beliefs of both sides, then we get to be in this dynamic placing play of both structure, the world in which we live in, and flow, the world in which our body resides in. Our body is 70 to 80% made of water. So this water knows flow, and yet our mind thinks structure, form, organization. So this is the stance, and you can call that masculine feminine, you can call that structure and flow, whatever words you want to use to it, it doesn't really even matter. They're just concepts that's giving our mind an encapsulation of what this human experience is really about. And this, these kind of lessons, uh, my, my favorite to go to is like order and chaos. Hmm. I feel that's what, that's what like resonates for me. Like the whole yin and the yang, there's order and chaos, whatever kind of modality whatever kind of set of teachings you want to go through all these ancient teachings always have these two opposing forces that are always discussed mm -hmm. and it's going on the global stage like you just said the the good and evil kind of type process that's always going on there's war that's bad there's peace that's good in what from one perspective and then there's also this going on within ourselves on a mm. daily basis. This is good. This is bad. This is a good experience. This is a bad one. The podcast was good. I had a really good time. You know, stubbing my toe this morning, that was bad. Mm -hmm. But then the flip side of that, maybe stubbing my toe this morning, stopped me going out and walking in front of a car because I was a little bit later. You know, maybe yeah. the podcast, maybe because I did this podcast, someone's going to start to shoot me in the face because I mentioned ejaculating on Ukrainian women earlier. <laughs> you know, it all seems, it's all, it's all respect. It's, it's all, <laughs> there's a matter of perspective always involved. So mm. what you talk about when you talk about that equanimity, being able to have that perspective of not really any good and bad mm -hmm. i think that's a, a really powerful space for everybody to get to because mm. or at least try to it's an ongoing battle for sure yeah but this is also something that i always try and instill in people whenever i'm doing my mindset talks etc it's just having that perspective and kind of removing that it's almost like a non-attachment mm -hmm. to experience because when you're not attached you're then in, able to go into that flow like state that you were just describing mm. How do you get people there? I mean, I know it's a, I know it's a big question. Right? I know I'm putting you on the spot a little bit here because it's like, well, maybe you need 25 years worth of work and you need to sit in a cave. But is there any teachings that are, you've come across in your time that really kind of allow people to understand that concept? Well, yeah, there's a, a lot I can share in that. Um, the first thing, and this is probably going to sound like the, like the sage mystic, is it's actually... There's nothing like when you get to that point, there's not something to understand. Yeah. You know, and, and that and that's like, OK, yeah, he's saying that thing. All right. He's like, oh, yeah, you get it's understanding, understandless, you know, whatever it is. But in a real way, it's like that part of our mind that's trying to contemplate how to get somewhere. And, and this is really where 
you can look at our upbringing because a lot of the ways in which we are raised is you get good grade, you get a pat on the back. You, you, know, you beat someone up in school, mom and dad says, what the fuck's wrong with you? So there's a part of our brain that's looking for the, the journey of how to get somewhere because logically that w is what brings safety. And so part of our animalistic kind of primal brain is wanting to keep safety. So the very part of us that's trying to get somewhere in our spiritual journey is actually the very part of us that needs to die in order to get somewhere. Because as soon as that part is trying to encapsulate a place of there's glory on the other side, the grass is greener over there, then we've identified a place in which we think we need to get to. And if we're not there, then we often shame ourselves for not being there. And, and so we can play on that side of like, there's nowhere to get and the journey is the, is the destination, all of that. And yet still we're in this human experience. And so the best thing somebody can do is, how can I wake up each day, ask my hands, be attuned to my body and say, how can I be of service? Like, what does it look like being in service? And by asking those questions, then the, the answers will just have a natural way of revealing themselves. And so this non-dual dualistic state, it exists more and more by our capacity to, to slow down enough to feel, to slow down enough to actually be silent in the chaos. Because the, inside the, the chaos, there's order. Inside the orders, there's chaos. They're, di they're dynamically balanced together and they, they literally do not exist without one another. So any attachment that we have to life needing to look a certain way, you want to ask yourself the right question. And you can look at this from the uh, uh, look at pain and pleasure. Often people are making decisions in their life that are trying to create a future that they think there's going to be more pleasure than pain. But that's like trying to say, I'm eventually in one year's time, the atom is only going to be positive and not negative. Well, no, it's still going to be positive and negative. So in our psyche, can we recognize that no matter what I do, I know that as I share more in the world and more money comes in and abundance and, you know, now that this book is coming out, there's going to be a different set of problems and challenges that come away. There's going to be a different set of, of pleasure that as well. But if I have in my mind that I'm going to create a world where all of a sudden I have this purely Instagrammable life and life is amazing and I just take pictures by the pool all day long and drink my margaritas and isn't life beautiful? Look at me how amazing it is. Yes, and what's underneath that? So we're always in this dance between pain and pleasure and if we're denying any parts of that, whatever we suppress on the inside gets expressed on the outside. So whatever it is that you're suppressing, whether, whether it be pain, um, even suppressing pleasure, anger, sadness, then you're going to have the people, places, and experiences in the outside world that are literally reflecting those places back to you to say, hey, you think you're enlightened. Have you looked at that you know, painful situation? Have you observed that place? So you're utilizing life as a classroom where every individual you come across can be a place of, okay, hey, how, where am I learning from this? How am I evolving? How can I grow and evolve? Because in that evolutionary intention of life as a classroom, then that goal you might have to be in a non-dual, dual place of just being in the oneness of everything is going to naturally grow more and more. And, and science can actually prove this because Again, I'll break it down into the, the negative and the positive. Whenever I'm only in the drama of the negative and, oh my God, life is terrible, and then I swing back the other way and it's like, it's bliss, and then things happen, and then I go back, oh, and then, ah, oh. and so we're in this back and forth, and literally the more that we're able to neutralize, equilibrate, bring to balance all of these two dualistic forces, then the frequency to which our cells are vibrating goes more into a place of what you could call enlightenment. Enlightenment being the place of we're not going somewhere. And those people, in my perspective, that are like, I'm enlightened. It's like, yeah, the frequency of their body 
might be vibrating in a place that doesn't go into the, the ebbs and the flows and the deep troughs and the high waves. So they might have learned how to be more in that place. But I personally think, and that's why, you know, Raven and I run the Embodied Awakening Academy is the deepest awakening initially for me was a transcending out of the body and into this cosmic reality of like, oh, whoa, I am one with everything. And, you know, anyone who's, I'm sure, experimented with plant medicines has had these experiences. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I have, Aaron. I have. And then it's like, okay, what happens when I then drop that into the body? And the body, that is this darkness. Like when we go into the body, it can feel like this dungeon of like, oh, 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 what is all this stuff? So this is where embodied awakening, the embodied transcendent path, because it's, I think, sometimes easier. Like, and I did. I spent a while up in Nepal meditating in the, in the Himalayas, and it was beautiful, and I was one with God, and nothing existed. But then it's like, can I enter into the world and have a relationship and have a, <laughs> have a business? And, you know, I, you see as well, it's like, I, I think for me, the, the strongest spiritual practice I've come across in this life is teaching alongside the woman I love, running a business with her and being romantic partners. It's like, I can't think of a more mind storm or a, a shit storm <laughs> of ways where I can learn and grow and to navigate that with grace has been amazing and we have our own challenges we have our own highs and lows and everything else and so that journey is where we're aware of all of these different places and we make the intentional desire of okay spirit like i'm here to serve i'm here to love how can i share what's inside of me in a beautiful way where i can know myself as abundant i can live in the grace of of a higher purpose a higher knowing my authentic self and then still, you know, show up and sing and dance and, you know, be crazy in the, in, in the jungle. It's like, I want to do it all. Why not? <laughs> yeah. I love that um, when you talk about like, the, the balance between pleasure and pain. Mm. Because I feel like I spent most of my life trying to avoid pain subconsciously. Mm. I didn't realize I was doing it, mm -hmm. which is why I would drink a lot. It's why I would take drugs. It was why I would sleep with chicks and do all that type of thing. It's all because I'm trying to numb any negative feelings that come up and replace them with something that I feel happier about mm -hmm. and ironically there is no avoidance of pain when you really look at it and it's actually the avoidance of pain that causes a hell of a lot of suffering in the as every set of teachings will always say it's the <laughs> avoidance of pain that actually causes the real suffering right mm -hmm. because there's no avoiding pain mm -hmm. the, the unfortunate reality of this human experiences where we're having is that people that you love are going to die your body's going to deteriorate and it's going to be physically and emotionally painful you're going to go through a hell of a lot of distress you're going to watch people around you suffer so you have a choice you can try and avoid that your whole life and avoid any form of pain and suffering and cause more suffering in the process or you can make peace with that mm. and reach the place of equanimity mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's such a hard concept for people to get mm. and being with that pain and mm -hmm. this is why i love the teachings that you have as part of a body awakening academy this is why it resonated so deeply with me is because i did all the mindset stuff mm -hmm. i've done all the the psychology stuff and i understand how the brain works and i understand a lot of the subconscious patterning and the processes but what is often neglected throughout all of these teachings is what's going on in your body. Mm. What are you actually feeling and mm -hmm. how are you responding to those feelings? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I love that word respond because respond inside of it is, is the ability to respond to the world around. And our ability to respond to the world around is a direct correlation to what stuff inside hasn't been processed and hasn't been moved but it's you know a, a back into a like a shipping analogy or you know just any house it's like in any house you have pipes you know you have uh, the central water pipe and when if there's too much stuff inside the the drain and you keep pushing all that stuff down then the water isn't going to flow so what we're learning how to do is literally clear the pipes so that energy life force knows how to move from the crown of our head to our base and from our base to our crown. And we literally become a channel, a, 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 a being of spirit, a being of energy. And so our natural source is pure eternal energy. We're just, you know, coagulated up into this body suit. It's like, I know in some deep journeys, I'm like, whoa, I'm back in this body. Whoa, this is a really interesting body I'm in. Well, okay, how does this body want to work? How can I 
learn how to circulate energy in my body through breath, through sound and through movement. And the more, you know, people experience this in deep breath work journeys, all of a sudden they're increasing the oxygen capacity inside of their body. And so naturally the, they'll start to flush through all of the, the, the half, they're, they're literally on a quantum physics level, they're these half spin of particles that are held in certain cellular places in the body. And you can relate to this. How many times have you received a massage and all of a sudden he's touching an area of body or she, and you start to have memories or thoughts of something You're like, I haven't thought about that in ages. I know for me that, that, that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's like, so the body, the skin is storing cellular memory. And if that cellular memory is imbalanced in its perception, meaning that there's a belief that in the past there was more negative than positive, which is normally what people believe when they're still trapped in that place. So if I reverberate my mind to a moment in my past when I think that a situation happened that was more negative than positive, I'm then telling this body that's creating its own reality that is a primal primal creator i'm telling this body please create more situations like on a very computer programming please create more situations that are going to force me to love honor and appreciate the perfection of the past so what do we do how does it look in real world we hit our head against the same brick wall over and over thinking that the brick wall is suddenly going to change but what needs to change is our relationship to the brick wall. Like the issue is never the issue. It's how we relate to the issue. And, and this, this is, this is the, the journey of it all. This is why it's, it's, it's fun and crazy and chaotic and weird and wild and wonky. And the more weird, weird and wild and wonky we can be and dance in the nothingness and the everythingness, then here we are. And then it's so, so much more fun and enjoyable. <coughs> so what does that look like from a male perspective? So, because you spoke a lot about the whole level of suppression, how that manifests in, in general reality, mm. how when we don't embody these things and connect with the body, then the, essentially the reality that manifests is the reality of the past that is being brought into the future mm -hmm. is essentially what's being described there. And then, so in a male context, specifically mm -hmm. in the male journey, yeah. what are the things that are coming up through that? What are the main uh, kind of uh, barriers that have to be overcome? What are the things that you wanted to walk that 18 year old debaucherous Aaron through, <laughs> you know? I, I would, what I would love to speak to him is the understanding of the male biology. The male biology is penetrative in nature. So we create life by sticking our cock inside, seed comes out, and life is created. So there's a, a strong singularity focus of, you know, the hunter-gatherer in the male beings would go, I see game, I take game, I kill game. It's a very single focused thing, and, and that's great. It's great to be goal-oriented in that way, and I would have loved that 18-year-old to know that, and he did that well. But what requires to have a deeper integration is because you and I are both in male bodies, but also inside of us, because of this polarity we've been talking about, you can say there's also a, a feminine essence. There's, there's a feminine essence you, that can mean a lot of different things. But the way I'll, I'll define that is the male body is penetrative naturally by biology. The female body is receptive. She's receiving the seed of the man to create life. So the very place of receptivity for a man is where I find especially alpha men are going to grow the most, is their capacity to receive feedback, their capacity to receive information and to assimilate information and then not need to write a thesis statement on it. <laughs> <laughs> Easier said than done. Exactly, because what that requires is literally, again, biology, man see woman, I put seed inside woman, woman takes seed, and then it, as the seed develops with the egg, it enters into the womb, the womb of mystery. So naturally, female bodies are more connected to this mysterious element of the universe that doesn't always understand logic and reason understanding. And actually, there's a deep mystery 
that's alive and beautiful of the female body. And I'm sure any man can appreciate that. Like the, she's a walking mystery. One moment she's hot, one moment she's cold. One moment she's angry, next moment she's asking you to fuck her. It's like, what do I do with you? You're, t ah! Yeah. And so when a man can see that, and I know like that 18 year old was like, these women are, I'm just gonna keep fucking them because this is, this is, <laughs> this is confusing. I'm not gonna try to understand them. I'm, I'm gonna them. go with what I know. I'm gonna go with what I know. I'm gonna under, you know, I'm not gonna try to understand them. And, and in doing that, I get to increase my receptivity. And so what's required for a more integrative male body is to recognize how can I receive information how can I step more into the mystery of life? And that's going to feel uncomfortable because you, most men have probably spent 20, 30, 40, 50 years in the particular way. So what I find in, you know, and, and that I love in you know, the retreats and workshops is how can a man grow in his capacity to be more strong and powerful and masculine as well as his capacity to learn the deep and deeper depths of surrender. And for myself, when I met this field and I started to be more expressive and be more in the, the everythingness, because again, if you look at a, a Hindu reference point or anything, you have the, sh the masculine principle, which is the, the rock, the pillar. And then you have the feminine principle, which is just this energy swirling around of it. So the very nature of masculine is nothingness and the very nature of the feminine is everythingness and this is what are inside of both bodies so but if a man only knows singular nothingness then he has an entire aspect of his being that hasn't had a chance to grow up and mature so the more men male bodies can lean into their edges around receptivity around surrender around finding a deeper wavelength of of universal design then they can have a p more powerful integrative process. They can have a more powerful place to play in all of it. And when I was like, even was invited into any spaces that was going to bring surrender into my body, I was like, fuck no, like nothing, none of that. This is weird. You're gay. This is like, <laughs> stay, stay away from me. This is not like my military self was like this. These are some weird dudes. But then again, back to that voice, it was like there was a voice inside that was expanding into, okay, like I see my edge here. I can meet that edge. I can keep leaning into that door and keep coming back to safety. I can keep leaning into that door and to see what's open. And I can know myself in the values that I am. And the biggest issue that men often find is that they think if they you know, become more receptive, then all of a sudden they're going to be labeled as society this way. Or if they, or if they're more receptive and they become more masculine and they become more like strong and clear and determined, then they're going to be labeled in society this way. Whatever the trajectory is, it's having the, the willingness to recognize what label, belief, idea am I holding on to as a point of reality? And can I dissolve that point to create something more expansive? Can I dissolve that strong belief that's like, nope, men are this way, women are this way, this is this way, this is this way, and it's like, yes, and. Yes, and what else is possible when I, as a man, can increase my receptivity and actually play in a bigger place of being very strong? And the more that I leaned into the places of surrender, the stronger, the more clear, the more abundant, the more on point my masculine energy became. And intellectually in my mind, I never thought that would happen. But that's what I began to embody and began to experience as I increased the parameters of where I was moving in this human experience. I don't know if you remember the first time I received a massage, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just lying there like, I can't receive. Just sat there thinking about what do I do in this situation? What am I? Doing? That whole control piece. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was a real big thing. I, I realized through doing this work that my receptivity was zero. My whole world existed in the kind of alpha male kind of range and a complete inability to receive. Mm -hmm. 
I would love for you to kind of describe what are the, especially for people that are like, well, what's the benefit of mirror seeing? What do I even get from this? What mm. is the, what's the fucking point? Is it going to make me better in my business? Is it going to make me show up more in my relationship? Mm. What are the real world implications of being a man that is strong in his masculinity and who's able to receive mm -hmm. and be connected with this feminine? Well, I'll share a story and, you know, there's a part of the masculine psyche that does love to give. We love to be the provider. We love to be the one that's like, I'm providing the wealth, the safety, the support. And, and that's a beautiful principle, and, I, and I, I love that. And I had an experience when I was actually doing my master's program um, after the first year, as a two-year program. Like, I was living off my boat. I, I spent a lot of the, the sailing money I had, and I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm on it. And then I looked at my bank account, and I'm like, I, this, I don't, think I'm not. This, is, this is not <laughs> going to happen. And I'm like, okay, spirit, like, you know, you want me here. I'm doing this thing. I'm, I'm listening to you, but I, how do I, how does this work? And so I, I sent out this, there's about 250 people in the program I went, I went through and I sent out this message. I wasn't asking for support. It was kind of this poetic dance of just like sharing what was moving for me. And, you know, I said, there's probably a good chance I'm, I won't be able to continue into year two with you guys because there's just, I, I don't financially, I'm not able to. And so this, this guy who was in the class, he reached out to me, you know, probably a few hours. I sent this email out. I went for a walk on the beach and I just surrendered. And I'm like, okay, whatever. If I'm supposed to go back to sea, I go back to sea. If I'm supposed to be there, I go there. And this guy sent me a message and he said, Aaron, like, I, I really, I have some extra money. I was planning on donating back to the school anyways. I love this program. It supported me so much. But I would love to, to provide financial support for you to be there in the second year. And I was like, whoa. And so my mind initially took this in and was like, uh, wow. Like, I was kind of celebratory. And I was, I was like, excited. I'm like, okay, this is amazing. And it's like, I can do this. And, you know, he was really, he was just like, I want to donate anyways. And I know what you're going to do in the world. And it, it touches my heart to know that I can support that. And so on the first weekend of the, of the program, I was there. We all got together. We'd have our summer break, and we were all sharing, excited. And I just sat there. My body was numb. I was looking around, and I'm like, all of these people here, they had the money to be here. All these people here, they, they're, they're better than me. All these people here, they were able to be here, and I had to receive like money to be here. I don't deserve to be here. And this was the story in my head, and it was so strong. And I'm like, who am I to receive this? Like, who am I? And, and on the first break, a, a friend of mine, I was talking to her, and um, I was sharing this. And, and she said, well, if you had, if you had that money, and would you want to give that to someone? I said, yeah, absolutely. Like, I love this program. It's supporting me so much. And she's like, well, if you would want to do that, then why can't you receive it from someone else? And it was like, boom. Fuck. <laughs> wow, okay, like I need to practice in my receptivity here. And so I went back in and I was just crying and I was pouring out and I had so much stuff of all the times that I love to give, but I don't actually know how to receive from all the different conditions and programmings. And yeah, I went through that and it totally changed. And, you know, I feel very deeply blessed for that brother. And I just, because, you know, a few years after we finished the school, he ended up passing from cancer. And it like, it, it touches my heart that he was able to be there and support me in that way. And, you know, to know that, okay, there was a part of his soul that was like, okay, I might not be here for too much longer and I'm going to be able to support this man who I know is going to be doing a lot in this world. So that dance between giving and receiving was so powerfully recognized in that moment. I'm like, okay, I need to be able to receive more, to be the being of change that I want to see in this world. That's really powerful, man. I'm, I'm hearing like a, a real distinct link between receptivity and worthiness. Mm. There's very much a link there, isn't there? Between if you're able to receive, then it's because you feel worthy of receiving whatever it is. Yeah. I know a lot of people in the world, and I think myself included, I felt very comfortable giving. Like back in the day, I was, when I was young, I had a lot of money around me. I was running around doing lots of different things, ducking and diving. Mm -hmm. And I used to love to give. I was always like making, looking after everyone around me, paying for everything, and I felt very comfortable with that. But I didn't feel as comfortable receiving, I didn't want to take anything from anybody, mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. And 
what I'm, and I, I recognize now, and especially it's kind of been highlighted specifically about what you were just saying there, there was a large part of me that didn't feel worthy of receiving. Like, it's almost like a, to earn my spot in the world, I needed to contribute to other people's lives financially mm. in some capacity, because I wasn't good enough just to be there, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. What would you say is, how would you kind of depict the, the link between worthiness and reception? It's directly correlated because our capacity to like, for one, we don't need to receive or give anything to know ourselves as worthy of love. We are love intrinsically embedded eternally. There's no part of our being that isn't love vibrating in full, full everything. So anything that that's getting in the way of our capacity to receive is just thoughts, beliefs, and ideas that are taken away from our idea of knowing ourselves as love. So it, there, there's a direct correlation because I find the more I know myself as being a strong, vibrant leader, teacher, speaker, facilitator, whatever word I want to put to it, and I can know that worth inside of me, then I'm able to actually receive more of what the universe wants to provide for me. I'm able to receive more, and this is a direct correlation, especially financially and in in, with abundance. The more I check in with myself and say, okay, how can I be beneficial with where I'm at right now, and how can I support myself and others around me to live in greater continuity to the truth of this universe, then I can receive more abundance, love, knowingness, into my being because I'm listening to the chords of my heart. And, and so the, anyone who's listening who might feel like unworthy or not able to receive you know, their partner's love or their mom or their dad or anyone, it's like, okay, looking themselves in the mirror and just bringing that back to say, I'm worthy of love, like I am love. There, there, there may have been a separation and I can forgive myself for buying into the belief that there was a separation and return to the pure source I know myself as. I think the first barrier, at least it was for me, I didn't even realize that I didn't think I was worthy of love for a mm -hmm. long time. I didn't even know because I was, I've always been a very confident person. Mm -hmm. I've always been happy walking into a room, saying how I feel, talking about whatever, cracking jokes, all the rest of it. So for me to actually think that I did, there was a part of me that didn't think I was enough was actually kind of alien to me. Mm. How do you kind of recognize that? The only reason I recognized it is because I realized I wasn't able to receive. I realized that link between not wanting to receive and them not feeling worthy of receival. How do you really tap into that and, and recognize that maybe? What are some indicators that you're in that space where you don't feel good enough? Well, I would say I'll connect that to what I've seen, especially in the last year or two with, with COVID is, is the male suicide rates going up because there's a lot of men who d don't, know like they feel alone and they feel empty so if you're if you're listening and you feel like you know the indicator of that is do you feel like nobody's there do you feel like nobody's listening do you feel like you know you're on this journey all alone and and you're suffering and 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 the the invitation would be to take a walk, walk in nature first and just to allow nature to receive the gift of nature's beauty i love being here in bali because there's so much to receive and there's so much to give. And the more that I can look at the world around me and say, okay, you know, how can I receive more love in my body? And maybe if you're feeling more altruistic and, you know, that place that just wants to give and give and give, then the invitation is to actually turn that the other side and say, okay, how can I receive more? And if you're one of those people that just loves to receive and receive and receive, how can I give more and find this balance. I find for most male psyches, the, the go-to is let me give so that I feel, I, so that I feel worthy because there is, and there is a worthiness association to it. Like when the man comes back from the forest and he provides the big deer on the plate, it's like, and everyone's like, Hey, good job. Mm, mm, mm. Like it, it, there's a worthiness, <coughs> there, there, there's a place inside. So how can you provide service? provide value into the world and not and just know yourself as worthy and not have that be a representation of your worth if that makes sense yeah for sure and and th that's a challenging place because the ego identifies as i am the provider i am the ceo i am the business owner and by being that 
that's where my identity is creating worth. And this I see a lot, you know, a lot of the coaching I do is probably, you know, 50 to 60 year old men who have made it. They're very successful. They're doing great. But all of their identity is associated to the labels that they put themselves underneath that is usually this very tender little girl that doesn't feel loved, that doesn't feel worthy. And, you know, that, you know, multi-million dollar CEO doesn't want to hear that, but yet he's hit a roadblock where no matter what he does, no matter what he creates, it doesn't feel worthy enough. He doesn't feel good enough. Mm. I've had that conversation countless times. And how can that one inside begin to receive the love that maybe she's never received before? So I think it's such a common thing specifically for men to chase all of these different accolades. Mm -hmm. The reason we do it is because we want to feel like we're good enough. We want to feel that love, that appreciation. We want to feel validated. I suppose it's a good way to explain that. And then getting to the end of the road, whether that be in terms of age or whether that be because you've achieved all of this success that you thought was the answer. And then ultimately the thing that led you to do all those things was just looking for love <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> that's if you want to boil it down to it's because what we're talking about here is just boiling down all these different mindset concepts, but we're putting it down to first principles as to what little boys and girls actually want deep down inside <laughs> um, and the lives we create around it. To be loved, to yeah. be cherished, to be adored. You know, and, and the other, you know, your big principle that I, I hear people saying, I healed my abandonment wound. Mm. I no longer have abandoned. And, and the reality is the very, there's a very deep source part of us that the moment we incarnated, we feel abandoned to source. We feel abandoned to the very source to which our soul has come from. Whatever that source is, we can pontificate it at the end of the world. But when we think finally one day I've healed the abandonment womb, it's like there's probably still a part inside that's like, I, I still want to go home. Because at 18, when I was on that ship and I wanted to jump overboard, like there was all the chaos and things I was going through, but there's also a part of my soul that was like, this whole human thing kind of sucks. Like, let's just go. Like I was on my way to Kuwait. It was the Iraqi war. I'm like, what am I really doing? How did I end up here? What the fuck? <laughs> what is, why are we in war? What is this world about? It's like, just go home. Like, just, Jump overboard, some sharks will eat you, you'll deteriorate <laughs> back into life. <laughs> might as well, you know, know, might as well, it's a point. But it was in that moment where it was like, okay, there's something I'm here to do. I don't know what that is, but, and, and that, you know, like I was saying earlier, that opened up this dialogue inside of me where I just started to have a conversation with my higher self. And this is something that I recommend to, you know, a lot of clients and people in all of this. It's like, Begin to dialogue, see what's there. Like, what, where is your higher self guiding you? There's a higher principle, there's a higher source, there's a deep knowing inside. And just as we've been talking about, are you listening? And can you just allow that voice to express? And it doesn't mean you need to go do everything it's saying to do, and it's probably not even gonna give you direction. It just wants to maybe be fucking heard. <laughs> so on that note, what's, uh, what's the voice telling you to do now? What's your, what's your master plan? My master plan, well, my master plan is, <laughs> um, I've just wrote this whole book called The Embodied Man, Mastering Masculinity in the Heart and the Belly and the Balls. And, you know, it's an opportunity for the work that I've been, you know, learning and growing my personal stories to be shared out in the world to support a lot of men. So the, the service oriented part of my heart sees a lot of men, male bodies that are, that are unnecessarily suffering, that are going through a lot of challenge, wanting to take their life. So the, the master plan is inside right now, you know, December 1st, there's a, a book, book release that's going to be happening. Like I've poured everything that I have into this. I want any man who's like struggling with relationships, struggling financially, struggling with their life, just to say, okay, like you can do these practices. You can begin to turn your energy inward. And in doing that, yeah, like I know I'm going to create more abundance, but there's such a deep service part of my heart that does, didn't know anything else of what to do. You know, I had the download for this a few months back. Uh, my beloved went back to Australia to dance in the craziness of Australia. Thank God she's with her children again, which makes me very happy. And, you know, when, when Shakti was drawn, it was like, okay, there's a book that wants to write through me. Okay, what do I do? Okay, let's go to the mountains. Let's go write the fucking book, Aaron. Let's go write right. the book. And it was like, ooh, three, four weeks later, book is done. It was like, okay, I need an online course for this. Okay, 
boom, in the last two weeks, I've created the 10 week online course. And it's like just growing and being in full productivity mode and, and loving that. Uh, and I'm just about to be, you know, venturing out of this bubble of Bali out into the world, which feels, yeah, it feels exciting. It feels uh, interesting to see what's happening on the planet other than this world of Bali and see some family. Um, so that's kind of my, my immediate trajectory and just continuing to do the, you know, the, the one-on-one -on -one client work and the retreats and workshops and supporting the best I can to, to bring these principles that we've been talking about here into someone's lives so that there can be a tangible grounded change into their world. I love that. I think that's a really cool point to end on. Um, I'd like to say from my end, uh, you've had a real powerful impact on my life and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to have learn from you in so many different ways especially from your past experience a lot of it is very relatable to the journey that i was on and yeah it's had a real powerful impact on the the way i show up in the world so i'm deeply grateful for that mm. uh, it's been great and it's been an absolute honor to support alongside you on some of the retreats as well that's Absolutely. been amazing yeah. um i'd love for you to tell people where they can find you and uh, more of your work where's this book the name of the book where it's going to be yep. uh, and just where your socials are and where they can get a hold of aaron kleinerman yeah, for sure. And, and to that, I, I just want to honor your, your willingness because uh, I've seen your journey of the last you know, year, year and a half since we've come into each other's lives. And there's just a deep willingness inside of you that I really honor and appreciate. So appreciate thank, thank you, man. brother. And I love what you're creating here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, the book's called The Embodied Man. It is a integrative journey into merging all of these parts inside of us. And it's really a masculine manual. It's mastering masculinity from the head to the heart to the balls. Um, you can go onto my website, AaronKleinerman.com, uh, my social Instagram, The Soul Navigator. You can check out all the stuff there. The work that uh, Raven and I do at the Academy is Embodied Awakening Academy, and all the places there as well. So we'll be running a living tantra retreat actually in mexico beginning of the year so oh, we, yeah. have that, we have that plan i'll be doing another men's initiation the journey we were on in costa rica in november okay um so yeah lots of places and these retreats you know depending on when you're watching this there's <laughs> they're they're happening kind of continuously you can go up on the, the our websites and uh, check that all out so um, lots of free gifts and resources we have our podcast channel as well love sex and freedom um, it just really captures all of this. How do we love more, yeah. have more sex and be free? <laughs> I mean, that sounds kind of fun to me. Yeah, why not? Like, who's not interested <laughs> in that? And yeah, I've got to say, I highly recommend the retreats. They're fucking mind blowing. Mm. Uh, a really amazing container full of fucking weird and wonderful madness that, <laughs> that will push you in every different direction that you feel uncomfortable in. But on the other side of that is some serious fucking power. Mm. Um, so yeah, I highly recommend them to anyone. Mm. And I might be over that way. Who knows? I'm just a quick heads up. I'm meant to be leaving here in a couple of weeks possibly going to the uk okay. similar little thing do yeah. see some family and then i'm heading off to dubai for a month okay and then quite likely heading over mexico way so amazing looks like the stars might align and i might be on another retreat in the very Star, near future stars are aligning come, come, come together yeah, i appreciate yeah. it man thank you very much for coming in yeah thank you brother thank you bro <laughs>